<clears throat> Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello. Art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M. And I'm back with yet another video. Yes, back so soon after yesterday's uh, viewer mail coffee time with y'all. So welcome back all of you. I enjoyed doing the viewer mail a great deal. Uh, and I hope you all, you know, those of you who watched, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope, you know, you go to my video section. Um, where is it? There it is. Yeah, there it is. Time for a coffee break. I almost talked for two hours. I've been doing these long ass videos and yeah, it's, it's 77 views, but two, I got two more subscribers which is awesome. Hello and welcome new subscribers. If you're watching this, uh, I had a marvelous time. I've been, I've been thinking lately about Stanley Kubrick's Lolita and of course its relation and its possible influences, um, to the shining and how like Stanley Kubrick is doing self-referential stuff between those two or between all of his movies. There seem to be, there seem to be things that he reuses, recycles, uh, whatever in, in, uh, when he makes his films. Okay. So anyway, I had a marvelous coffee break. Thank you all, uh, for your comments. I know there's a couple more today, but, uh, I might do just a general viewer mail maybe in a couple of days I don't know like from from a bunch of different videos like I need to figure out like a schedule or like a way to do these coffee breaks that makes sense uh, um I just do I just switch on the machine and I start talking um but you know I I've been uh, it's my way you know it's it's not anybody else's way it's my way nice and casual nice and easy you know um, <clears throat> today, what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, before I tell you what we're going to talk about, let me do my little church announcements, uh, while I've got you on, on the line, uh, <clears throat> returning viewers. Thank you for returning new viewers, all two of you, I guess, or two new subscribers. Thank you for being new, uh, subscribers thank you for subscribing yeah and uh, don't forget to like comment subscribe and share uh the video or any of videos if you like them if you know somebody who might be interested in this um and that's that that's my little church announcements uh segment of the program and now let me get into it what am i going to talk about today you guys and how does it possibly relate to stanley kubrick specifically lolita and the shining which is what i'm kind of um ocding about lately let me show you i did a community post a little while ago not this one but please do go ahead and watch this video with david lynch discussing the stanley kubrick film lolita it's is good and then this one i did a little while ago seven days ago my god when i was still in my little funk and i said i can't just like do a post like this and not follow up with <laughs> with with a video. So we're going to talk about this today. Again, very casually. I'm just going to ramble like I always do. Fire up the percolator. Okay. Or or get your DoorDash or your Uber Eats or your, what's that other one? Postmates people to get to deliver you a nice big frosty iced coffee because it still is summer. It still is summer. And I do iced coffee all the time. I actually prefer iced coffee to hot coffee. I'll do a hot coffee every now and again, but for some reason, something about my personality and my character, I just love lattes. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. I have that in common with, with the um, main character of that show that was so popular maybe about a decade or so ago, Weeds. Um, the the title the the main character of that show the lady and i can't for the life of me remember her the actress's or the character's name right now but that was like her thing she always had to have a latte and i can so relate to that it just makes life better it makes life easier a nice tall frosty iced coffee with whatever creamer or flavoring you like um that's me that's my that's my that's my uh what should I call it? That's my zhuzh. I love it so much. And I've, I, I used to be a pumpkin spice hater 
Um, but recently, it's August. It's it's not even September, and they're already selling. There's a whole wall at my local grocery store. There's a whole wall of pumpkin spice merchandise and paraphernalia at my local grocery store supermarket. And I walked past it. I almost took a picture, and I said, "What the hell is this?" There was pumpkin spice pancake mix. There was pumpkin spice muffin mix. There was I, come. I mean, really. <clears throat> and then I went to the dairy case, and I said, "You know what?" Miss Sam, I said to myself, why not? Let me get one of these pumpkin spice flavored coffee creamers and just see. See whether or not I'll like it. See whether or not it actually tastes like pumpkin pie. And I got it and I put a little bit in my coffee. I mixed that together with half and half and the black coffee and plenty of ice. Swish it together and you know what? It was actually good. I hate the pumpkin spice stuff from Starbucks, but this, what I made at home, actually not bad. I actually had a little bit a while ago, and I'll have a little more when I take a break during during the making of this video. Anyway, well, this is an appropriate conversation because we're talking about food. So this image, let me see if it, if it, yeah, look at this image. Okay, I got nine, nine likes, three comments. Hello, y'all. Hamburgers. <laughs> Stephen says the cornerstone of any nutritious breakfast. That's right. I don't even like breakfast food. I don't ever eat breakfast. That's just me, though. Um, that I don't know. I was raised by Europeans. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, Eastern Europeans, like, they really don't do breakfast. Uh, Tankard says, based on my understanding, food used in pictures are not real. That's what I've heard, too. I've heard that it's like, you know, for, for all we know, this hamburger is shellacked. We, we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> And uh, Chris Leroux says, I'm watching The Sopranos, and without the food, there'd be no show. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. I, You know what? Food is so important in art. It's just so darn important in art. And if you saw, like, the thumbnail, that's what I put. I put this picture that I found. On a, just, I, I typed in the word food in the Google search, and I... I, I saved the first photograph that I found, and that was this one. Um, it's hamburgers and fries. It's so quintessentially American. And this one's nice and meaty. Since I'm not doing carbs, except my little coffee creamer, I, I, I don't, I'm not an extreme low carber. I do like, I try to make sure I do less than 100 grams a day. And that is technically a low carb diet. So. You know, if you have any suggestions, if you think I'm 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 doing too much, let me know. I'm, I I feel much better than when I ate carbs like normally, like you know, potatoes, French fries, tortilla chips. Um, I wasn't really doing bread because I have an issue with gluten, but you know, no bread, no pasta. But yeah, uh, potatoes, all different kinds of potatoes, tortilla chips. What else did I? Oh, rice. I love me some rice. Fried rice is everything, but I can't have it now because I'm just not doing it. So I, I, um, I, I just, I, I had a taco salad today, a low carb taco salad. If you're interested, I'll give you the recipe pretty quick and easy. Um, but anyway, so we need to talk about food. I said here, especially foods role in art. Okay. And like Chris LaRose says, there's no show without the food in the Sopranos. That is very interesting because it's a show about, you know, it's a stereotypical show about Italian people and they're, I guess, in the mob and Tony Soprano is supposed to be some sort of capo or consigliere or some, some character or some figure like that in the world of the American, American Italian mafia, right? Um, and Chris LaRose, if you're interested, I did a I did a little video that got copyright stricken, but it's still up there, um, about the very last scene of the show, like the last show, the last episode of the last season, when they're in the diner and the whole thing, right? Um, so check it out if you're interested. From The Sopranos, I did that. Now, food is incredibly important. Because you need to eat to live, you ju you just do. 
There's there's no way around that. If you don't eat, you'll die. That that's that's very basic. But as far as its role in art, um it's not I don't believe that its role in art is necessarily about sustenance or nourishment. It's largely symbolic. And like I was talking about with regard to um Stanley Kubrick. I've been thinking about that for a little while. Before I get into that, but like I said, I, this is the first picture I found in the Google search, and this is from an ad, or yeah, and the for the very first picture is a picture of a big old hamburger cheeseburger with tomato and lettuce. Where are the pickles and onion? Oh, there's some pickle down here, but I need some onions. No, this is ridiculous. I it needs onions, and this bun is just way too big. But anyway. This is the first picture I found, and it was a an ad for like Hotels.com. The first image I found when I typed in the word food in the Google. I don't know what that might mean, but I figured if it's the first image, it's probably also the most popular image. Right? Isn't that how, how those things work with ranking stuff on, on Google or whatever? You know? Um, but like I said... Let me let me switch over back to my um, home page. Hold on. I've been thinking a lot about Lolita and The Shining. Okay, and since we're talking about food in this video, I, I again I've only watched Lolita once. I yes I am gonna watch it again. I just need a little time to like um, wind up my brain so so I'm ready for it mentally, but. The only food that I really remember in Lolita was when Dolores delivers Humbert Humbert his breakfast that, that Charlotte, Dolores' mother, cooks for him. And she takes upstairs. And what is it, Richard Tankard? I don't know if you've been thinking about this too, but like, I'm going to lay this on you. Um, what, what is the breakfast for Humbert Humbert when Dolores brings it to him? It's bacon and eggs and toast and you Richard mentions the toast or he he's been talking about the toast I won't say what he says about the toast I think he said it in my comments too but um, the the toast is important in that scene bacon and eggs and toast she brings that to him and I don't know if there's orange juice and coffee on the tray I need to watch it again but Y'all, that should remind you of something if you're a shiner. That definitely reminds me of the scene where Wendy brings Jack his breakfast in bed in the beginning of the movie after they've just moved in. Well, actually, they didn't just move in, but like after we have the tour of the hotel on closing day, the very next scene is Wendy wheeling Jack his breakfast on the cart um, and the breakfast is bacon and eggs and toast and orange juice and coffee okay very very similar like like I said I have to rewatch Lolita to see if there's orange juice and coffee as part of Humbert Humbert's breakfast but the food part like not the drinks part the food part bacon eggs and toast and Lolita eats she tells him like she eats the bacon on the way upstairs mm -hmm. and then there's that toast and and that's the same breakfast that wendy makes jack the very same so like i said stanley reuses a lot of stuff from lolita in the in the shining including that breakfast okay is stanley drawing a parallel between Lolita and Wendy because they both they both bring uh, their abuser I guess like most people see Jack as as this horribly abusive character and I can see why they say they they feel that way it, that's that's how it looks in the movie but so both of them they're bringing their abusers the same breakfast bacon eggs and toast Okay. 
What in the world is the goings on? I don't know, but I just wanted to mention that since I'm doing a, a video about food today. Now, I've got all these nice articles lined up that I'm not necessarily going to read all of them to you because there's a bunch. I Let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, six of these articles that I just want. I just put food and art in the Google search, and this is what I found. Okay, this is from a website called the different level dot com of course i'll leave it in the um description and i think i'm going to start like not leaving these um links in the description to articles that i cite in my videos i'm going to start doing that on my blog and if you want to know more you're just going to have to go to my blog and maybe i'll write a little something summarizing but you know i got to get that i got to get that blog going um I, I really need to like, yeah, concentrate on it. And they have this image, this classic, like, I think it's pop art image of all these very geometric looking cakes here. Like we got an angel food cake and layer cake and chocolate cake and my good, and a cake with a heart on it, whatever. So this article is called A Bite Size History of Food Art. Okay. Um, and the first thing they mention is the lavish Roman feasts to the Instagram photos of today. So they're equating that. They're 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 saying, you know, whatever we're seeing on Instagram now, and there's a bunch of food on Instagram, on TikTok, um, maybe even Twitter too. But I, you know, especially watch the ones on Instagram because I like finding new recipes. And there's just a lot of times there's just you know the ones. There's just people who have accounts on Instagram or t or TikTok and it's just they they film themselves eating eating food from various restaurants and fast food places there's a guy that I was watching just recently and and his mission or one of his missions on his Instagram uh account is to eat what he says eat every bean and cheese burrito that exists so i think he's based in la and you know you'll find it if you search it just bean bean and cheese burrito after bean and cheese burrito after bean and cheese burrito so that's his bean and cheese burrito series and then he has a peanut butter and jelly series peanut butter jelly sandwich and then he has a club sandwich series and then he has a breakfast burrito series and seems to be doing okay on his ig um depictions of food have always captivated the human imagination seems like it it really does um it's not the highest selling subject matter when people buy art the highest selling first place is pictures of people okay figure paintings the second highest selling is like landscape seascape um and the third highest is uh still lifes and that could mean just anything it could mean a floral arrangement or food usually fruit is is what what we've come to kind of understand when we see still life paintings plenty of fruit but we're going to see some interesting ones today and that's part of the reason why i got these articles together so i don't have to go hunting around for um pictures of food and art so anyway uh we've got this article it's the last sentence of the second paragraph tells me a lot. It says, it is fair to say that Roman painters paved the way for food artists in Western art history. Interesting. They mentioned Bacchus, the god of wine, and the Ceres, S-C-E-R-E-S, -E the goddess of grain. So they're, they're saying that what we're looking at, what we see, the development of the use of images of food in art goes all the way back to ancient rome that's really interesting i would say it goes all the way back to way before rome so i don't know why they're saying that they're, they're using rome as a starting point no it goes all the way back to mesopotamia possibly even back to prehistory in the stone age because those pictures of bison which you will see when i finally do my uh Art History 101, like Unit 1, um, chit-chat video. Those bison 
on the cave walls, like in Lascaux or whatever. Or, th th yeah, that's food. <laughs> Those animals are food. Okay. I hope I'm not offending any vegans. But, like, you know, we're just talking about history or whatever. Like, these were hunter-gatherers. Their food was animals. And they're depicting them in the caves. Are these animals sacred? Or are do they look at them as sacred? Or do they look at them as delicious? Because, like, there's that episode of King of the Hill. And you know. You know I love me some King of the Hill. There's that episode of King of the Hill where Hank is, like, they're at a ranch or something, a cattle ranch. And everybody else is looking at the cows and everything and saying how cute they are. And Hank Hill is looking at the, at the cow, living cows, just walking around, hanging out in the yard or whatever and he he looks at them and he says delicious he's not looking at a steak he's not looking at a burger or shish kebabs no no he's looking at a live walking mooing cow mm. okay so we have one example here of and they don't say what you're looking at but i'll enlarge it a little bit this is a it looks to me like an obvious baroque a painting and we'll look at the background over here good lord there's this parrot there's a whole bunch of grapes there's oysters lemon orange um a ham is there a lobster i don't see a lobster but we might see a lobster in one of these paintings this is this is ritzy this is high class this is um luxurious expensive food even for the time period like we think of food as easily accessible now with inflation prices we're realizing like you know we could should have kept our mouths shut we should have just enjoyed it while it lasted but you know all of this stuff here the ham even the fruit we think of we think of all of these things as as easily accessible no at least not no in throughout history this kind of food has been accessible or easily accessible mostly to rich people and that's that's been the case for a long time we got a melon here we got what looks like some peaches and the fact that there are citrus fruits in here and this is very possibly a northern european uh painting means that this is real swank because citrus fruits do not grow in northern climates because it's too cold so they're probably imported from Spain. Okay. The, 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 the lemon and the orange. Um, possibly the grapes too. I'm, though I'm not sure. I, I don't know very much about agriculture. But anyway, I'm not going to analyze this painting right now. It's just part of this article. Uh, it, this article talks about food art in the Middle Ages. It mentions Leonardo da Vinci. Yep. The Last Supper. Um, <sighs> what a lot of these articles that i that i found i skimmed all of them um what they're really not talking very much about and i don't know why is food's relation to um religion and how food stuffs or individual you know ingredients or whatever are all religious symbols like all of them even in this painting that we just looked at yep all of it every single last thing including the bird including the bird and there here goes some bread over here look at it it's small but there it is it bre bread and grapes come on now if i mean you don't even have to know that much about christianity to know that the bread and the grapes are christian symbols okay so food art in the middle ages eating habits of the wealthy yada 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 um mm, no no, I, that's why. But I'm I'm still going to leave these in the description so you can look through them. Still life imagery. Again, these images were, they say, especially in the Baroque, the Dutch and Flemish masters, and, the, and probably also Spain in the Baroque period, uh, were meant to show off the painter's technical skills by depicting detailed, highly realistic images of food. Yes, possibly. Possibly. Um but again there's way more going on and i believe it's still going on pop art feminist art they mentioned andy warhol's soup cans i think we're going to see them 
uh, pretty soon. And then we have just this picture of an egg. And this is what made me think of Lolita because, you know, me, me and Tankard have been talking about uh, that scene, that creepy ass scene with um, the egg and the toast and the missing bacon. Make of that what you will. Make of that. I don't know why the bacon is missing. She ate it. Lord, I don't know what's going on. I really don't want, I don't even want to speculate about that right now. But this is the first article, a bite-sized history of food. And bite-sized, it really is bite-sized. They barely say anything here. Um, then there's this one, Siberis. Um, and you can, if you, if you are more comfortable in Spanish, they have Spanish version, the significance of food and art. Um, and the, the, this second sentence they say also food helps define a culture and allow expression in preparation making the presentation of foods a creative outlet okay oh and they do mention the stone age okay cool because usually when it comes to like the discussion of food and art not a lot of people mention the stone age uh, foodstuffs have even been used to create art like juices and animal fats used in creating paint oh uh, since the Stone Age. Very interesting. Therefore, it is no surprise that food has been depicted in art for centuries. Mm, okay. All right. Still life, food in art as the subject. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. I have not yet found a, in any of these articles. And again, I just typed in food and art and found some articles that I thought would be good and I guess they're okay, but they're not quite what I'm looking for. So I'm just going to have to fill in the blanks for y'all. Um, and this is something, when I talk to people about it, because I saw this sentence, it says the realistic look of shiny fruit, the juicy meat, or the decadent roasted duck, all demonstrate the skill of the artist. Yes. And I always talk about, when I'm talking about this kind of thing in my uh, professional life, I always mention wax fruit. Those of you who are from the 70s and 80s, you know what that shit is. Wax fruit, your aunt, your grandmother, somebody had a bowl of it or a plate of it displayed prominently somewhere in the home. I think I talk about it in one of my earlier videos down here. Way, 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 way. You got to scroll and scroll to find it. But wax fruit just bugs me. It bugs me, and one day I will figure it out, I know. It's not real. You can't eat it. It's a three-dimensional representation of a food object, like in most cases fruit, apples, oranges, grapes, bananas, whatever. It, it's not there. It's, it, it, it's, it's not edible, but it's just there for quote-unquote decorative purposes. To me, there's no such thing as a decorative purpose. To me, everything I believe is a form of worship of some kind. But that's just my opinion. Y'all, y'all do with that what you want. And then, you know, the people that I worked with, they would, they would tell me, oh yeah, I, I was, I was in, um, you know, uh, I, I was somewhere downtown and there was this restaurant and they had all this fake food in the window. And I said, why? And they said, well, because they were advertising their real food, like, you know, like Japanese places, Chinese places, like the noodles in the window, completely fake. And I said, really? I was just fascinated by this. And you can go on Amazon and you can find, yeah, I think you can still find like fake fruit, wax fruit. You can, and it doesn't have to be fruit. It can be donuts. It can be a cake. It can be a pie. It, they have, they, 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 they've done it. Little, tiny little candles that are shaped like olives, martini olives. You know, the ones that are stuffed with pimentos or whatever. What the hell is going on? What in the world is going on? Anyway, um, and then they talk about dining as, a, as an experience, eating as the subject. Okay, and they mention the potato eaters by Van Gogh. All right. Food as a demonstration of social and economic status, particular food. Uh, food as subject and they talk about Jan Steen or they mention Jan Steen's The Dissolute Household. Okay, um, what again, they keep neglecting to mention the religious aspects, which bugs me. 
It really, really, really bugs me. Uh, food used symbolically. Food and art depicting something else. They get a little closer in this paragraph um, where they talk about there are several ways that fruit has been used symbolically in art. Uh, yeah, fruit. For example, in the Christian religion, the apple is linked to temptation. In the story of the Garden of Eden, it is used in this manner throughout, the hi throughout history, proven again in language where the Latin word for apple, malum, is identical for the, uh, to the word for evil, also malum. In Greek mythology, the pomegranate equates to temptation and sin. So what? That's my favorite fruit. What? What? Oh, especially in women. Well, damn it. I love pomegranates during the winter. I love them, love them, love them. Due to its depiction in the rape of Persephone. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in modern art, feminist artists began to use food and art to depict the restraint of being a wife and mother. While men were free to pursue careers and other activities, feminist artists like Elizabeth Murray used art to propose that women were able to handle both domestic life uh, and a career Murray's work in 1985, Kitchen Painting, is an outstanding example of this feministic threat. Now, I tried clicking on this. I got nothing, so I don't know. If, if you all try on your end, let me know. Uh, food used in the artistic experience, edible food and art. I don't even want to think about that. That just sounds gross to me. Uh, food as pleasure and aesthetic. Again, they barely scratch the surface, and I thought I found good articles. Damn it. Okay, now we got the Smithsonian, which, you know, they should be awesome. Okay. Uh, from subject to statement, food has played a role in art for millennia. This is from 2017. And look at this. They got like a lobster roll and fries in this picture. Again, this is one of the reasons I like these articles. I don't have to look for um, good examples of food and art. Then we got this, uh, Paul Cezanne, Still Life of Peaches and Pears. So the pears are over here, the peaches are over here. Um, and then some of them are on a plate. And then there's this sugar bowl over here. And then this pitcher looks like, you know, a porcelain with a floral pattern on it. Peaches and pears, peaches and pears. Okay, I don't know what this is here. It looks like a mango to me, but I doubt it. Um, and they're on this cloth. They're all positioned on this cloth, on this little table with a drawer. You see the drawer handle and the drawer cut out on the table. Um, have I mentioned the cloth of honor to you guys? The cloth of honor is the cloth that little baby Jesus is sitting on. He's sitting in his mother's lap, Mary's lap, and usually underneath him or or maybe even he's swaddled in it or, or whatever is a cloth uh, like a little towel or whatever that is called the cloth of honor and that little cloth of honor always positioned or usually positioned underneath baby jesus in these mary and jesus depictions that cloth of honor is supposed to prefigure or foreshadow his death and it's supposed to remind you of the shroud that he will be wrapped in uh, after he's cut down from the cross and dead. I'm just saying. And he put this here, underneath this fruit and, what is this, tea, coffee, whatever, arrangement. And, and it's got this red stripe going through it, which to me is reminiscent of blood, but that's just me. What is Cezanne saying here? It, what, what do these peaches and pears have to do with Jesus? And this drawer... Um, and this, this table that is tilted upward towards the viewer so you can see better what's on top of the table. Hmm. And then this background with this diagonal line. And then the base of what looks like maybe a coat rack or something. Wood. Is that the cross? I don't know. Just speculating out loud. Then there's this thing. It's called Large S'more from 2015 by an artist named Jennifer Coates. Ooh, this looks gross. I would never eat this s'more. It looks moldy. But you know what's going on here? Like, what are the what what is she doing? Is this a Rorschach test? Like, what's going on? Um, then there's still life with oysters and grapes. Sixteen fifty three, Jan David de Heem, encore. Again, this is the Northern European Flemish uh, work, and they even have the color strip down here. Like, ooh, 
Couldn't they edit this a little better? Smithsonian? You could have done better, Smithsonian. Um, but <laughs> we shouldn't be able to see these colors down here. But again, it's on a cloth. This one happens to be blue. There's oysters. Again, citrus fruits. Um, lemons and lemon wedges. Orange with the with the leaves still attached. Plenty of grapes. I see a loaf of bread propping up this tray with the oysters. And then the grape leaves. And this wooden table. Yes, this is a very heavily Christian image. I don't know what oysters represent, but I know they probably represent something. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. Trust and believe. Um, my goodness. Okay, let's keep it moving. And then there's this one that I'm not even going to try to even partially an uh, analyze. The Admiral, 16th century Giuseppe Archimboldo. What the hell? This, this person's body and face are made up of fish and eels and shit. Like, ooh. This is horrifying. But this is an admiral. What is going on here? I don't know. I really don't know. But this is um, the Smithsonian article on a brief history of food as art. Food as art. Uncorn. This is interesting. Um... You know, what are, what are they talking about here? <laughs> uh, <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I thought I found good articles. I could do better than this. Shit. Um, but <laughs> okay, and they do mention biblical texts. Okay, that's good. Here it is. Uh, and the author writes... Uh, in the 1600s, such paintings, they're talking about Dutch Golden Age uh, in Northern Renaissance paintings. In the 1600s, such paintings attested to the owner's wealth and intellectual engagement. That is called pronk. Okay, P-R-O-N-K, I think. I don't know if there's an H somewhere in there. But pronk means like a really luxurious spread of food like, like this. Or like the one that I showed you in the other article. Pronk is like a beautiful spread of food that is meant to, like this author writes, um, it, it is, where is the thing? Um, rendered to create the illusion that the feast is sitting right in front of the viewer in the 1600s. Such paintings attested to the owner's wealth and intellectual engagement. Yeah, the fact that they were able to afford Imported food is a big deal. Uh, the foods depicted had symbolic significance, often related to biblical texts. Yes. That's why I said um, every single last thing you see in a painting like this is some kind of religious symbol. It doesn't have to be obvious, because we live in a time where we don't think in those terms anymore. But these people at this time in history definitely did, especially if they were educated, especially if they were wealthy. Well, maybe not especially if they were wealthy, but like an educated person would definitely be aware of the religious meanings. Like I said, there are encyclopedias dedicated specifically and exclusively to uh, defining religious symbolism as far as any object, item, thing you can think of, including a lot of plants. And that includes plants that are eaten, food yeah, fruits, vegetables, flowers, herbs, meat, fish, game, cheese, bread, crackers, you know, unleavened bread. You name it. It's in there. It's in there in these encyclopedias. And all these different flowers, I mean, I mean, you know, the the different categorizations of flowers, like bi in, in bio, the taxonomy of flowers, each and every one of them has a different meaning depending on... um where you're looking at it or what time period or whatever right so that's carried over into these depictions of food straight up into the modern world we're just not aware of it or we're not taught to be aware of it okay that's what i wanted to uh, make sure i told you in this in this video the ancient world is still with us we're just we just are not told about it. We're not informed. We live in the world pretending that it's secular. It's not. 
it is not. That is my, that is how I feel about it. Now they talk about feminists again, and I don't really want to get into that. Not because I dislike it or, you know, but it's, that's not what I'm really going for in this video. As far as my own little discussion of, of food and art, right? Um, but at least they mentioned the religious aspect, which good for them. Very good for them. Okay, the Smithsonian. Okay, thank you, Smithsonian. Then we have the Wide Walls uh, article. And they have, got, they have some good images here, too. They've got this one up here. Again, an obvious Baroque, or at least obvious to me. I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. There's a, there's a loaf, little loaf of bread over here. There's some more bread hiding back here. There's these big ass hunks of cheese or half wheels of cheese. This, this one on top looks a lot more aged than the one on the bottom, but whatever. We're, again, all different colors of grapes, purple, red, green. This thing over here, is that an apple or a, or a peach or a nectarine? I don't know. We got nuts. Oh, and you know. Each and every, like I told you, like I done told you, each and every single last one of these has religious significance. Even the tablecloth, look at the tablecloth and the table runner on the table. Again, that is reminiscent, very, very strongly reminiscent of the cloth of honor that I mentioned. And I, I don't have time for it, but if I were to like analyze the pattern of the tablecloth and the table runner, with this little lace um, trimming, but I, I, th that would probably have religious significance too. Actually, let me take a little quick look. Yeah, look at this pattern on the red part. That looks like a stalk of wheat. So there you go. More bread. Okay. Uh, we got, what are these called? Chestnuts, walnuts, hazelnuts. At least that's what they look like to me. There's a fruit peel, somebody with this knife, with a blade facing upward. Lordy, lordy, lord. Uh, somebody obviously peeled an apple or something. Oh yeah, there's an apple. Okay, you can see the seeds in here. Peeled the apple, ate the apple, and left the peel on the table like a slob. Um, <laughs> somebody's been cracking nuts. But I see no nutcracker. Whatever. And then there's this little bun over here. Is this regular bread or maybe sweet bread? I don't know. There's a glass. What's in the glass? I have no idea. It's hard to tell. Is it water or wine? I have no clue. Then there again, there's a loaf um, hi hi hanging out back there. And then there's more apples over here. Apples, I mean, if that is, if you don't see the religious significance of the apples, I just don't know what to say. Um... And I don't think that this would be a, a pronk painting, like a luxurious food kind of thing. This would be maybe more of an onbaichi, which means little bites of food or like a little snack in Dutch. Um, because this is not like a real meal. This isn't like, you know, you sit down with meat and potatoes and whatever. No, no, no. This is a little cheese, a little fruit, a little bread, apples, and probably a little glass of wine. Um, you know, a snack. They didn't have convenience stores back then. They didn't have <laughs> Oreo cookies and Chips Ahoy and, um, you know, my favorite Flaming Hot Fritos or <laughs> Corn Nuts or M&Ms or Snicker Bars. or No, no, they had this stuff if they wanted to have a quick little snack. Cheese was like their convenience food. It w They could make it and preserve it. And in a lot of cases, the older cheese gets, the better it tastes, you know. But this this is what life was like for for and again, it's an onbaichi, but that doesn't mean these people are poor who maybe commissioned this painting by whoever did it. And again, plenty of religious significance, plenty the stalks of wheat in the in the tablecloth pattern. At least it looks like that to me. The buns and the bread, the apples, the grapes. Come on now. Come and if we really like really did our research, we would be able to figure out the significance of the cheese and the nuts, um, and the wine. If that is wine in the glass, of course you understand like what that means in the context of of a Christian image. Um, there's this thing. It looks like an enormous hideous hamburger that you can sit on. It looks like furniture. Uh, what is this? I, oh, this is what I wanted to show you. This is awesome. Uh, let me try to get rid of this thing. There it is. Okay. Um, I don't know who did this. This image on the right over here, the Taco Bell. Um, still life. 
with the which is very reminiscent of this here hello or 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 paintings like this from the baroque northern southern europe doesn't matter but um check it out like when i saw the oh my god they got a baja blast look at this they got tacos 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 on the central platter then they got the nachos bel grande i guess and they got some doritos in a crystal bowl for god's sake and then this over here i don't know what this is is this like a wet burrito or something i don't know and then they've got the taco 12 pack the 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 carrying case for possibly all these tacos that are laid out in front of it and all these little packets of, of varying degrees of hot hot sauce and of course the obligatory baja blast jesus christ whoever did this you know what whoever you are sir or madam um that did this still life with the taco bell food i salute you i really do because this is freaking genius I, I i would put this on my wall i sure would i don't know what room i would put it in somewhere hallway kitchen something because this <laughs> this is this is art this is this is <laughs> I, I i wanted to show you guys this picture so badly i don't know maybe i should even no i don't want to deal with copyright bullshit but like i would love to use this as a thumbnail for this <laughs> oh my, i'm gonna use the hamburger because that's how i like announced um this video in my community post but wow I just want a picture of this on the wall. This is gorgeous. But then there's, okay, the cakes and pies, like cafeteria style. Okay. Um, there's, again, another uh, Spanish fish, loaves. What else is here? Another fish. Uh, yeah, that's Jesus, fish and loaves. Come on now. Um, there's that French one. I don't even want to talk about it because I'm not big into that painting. Then there's the butcher stall at an open air market somewhere in northern europe okay and look at this poor deer and this poor goose oh my god and i guess he hasn't prepared these yet he hasn't like really butchered them they're just dead oh and i think that's a turkey over there oh my god this is horrifying but whatever right uh another one i guess this guy has prepared the meat there's a big old cow's head and fish and a side of beef and a ham and lord and 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 fowl and oh my god so this and the sausage this is horrifying but yeah this is what food looks like in it's in its unprocessed state like everything we eat is heavily processed let me go back to the taco bell one that one just i love that thing i wish i could find out who the artist is give them their props but this is wide walls depiction of food and art drawings of food could also be found inside egyptian pyramids um a recurring theme through the middle ages and renaissance to modern times food has been depicted as a celebration of a theme composition itself or a metaphor that's a good sentence and that that kind of sums it up in a way a celebration of a theme composition itself or a metaphor i would just argue that food always means something like maybe i've said in my other videos nudity always means something same thing with food food always means something which is interesting um and it says uh it is no wonder that the depiction of food and art spans across cultures and all yes all of recorded human history uh, appearing in myriad contexts this practice stretches back to ancient greece and rome where banquets and bacchanals were consuming passion celebrated in literature painting and mosaics okay all right um it's been around for a while yeah then there's this one again and costa valayer a white soup bowl okay and the, there goes that bread again and the cloth again if you've ever wondered now i told you whenever you see paintings like this and there's always a cloth somewhere underneath something whatever is on top of the cloth is supposed to be considered christ-like or a symbol for christ or his death or his resurrection or something okay i'm just saying and then there's this on the right antonio lopez garcia the dinner 
This kid looks miserable, and I don't see a lot of food on this table. Maybe that's why they're miserable. I don't know. I really don't. Short history of food in Western art. Ah, culture of antiquity, now that still life objects, and, and devotional and secular images. Encore. That's good. Uh, display of virtuosic skill of observation. Color, shape, texture, symbolic meaning. Uh, representing certain features, virtues, or values. The symbolism of food and drink was mainly rooted in classical literature and paganism. Okay, go ahead, white walls. Of course, you, 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 you nailed it way better than the Smithsonian did. Wow. Okay. Um, and a lot of the stuff they mentioned in this article is stuff that I've already kind of mentioned, um, in just my, my, my rambling as I, as I do this, uh, video. And yes, this is a woman wearing a meat suit, just like Lady Gaga. Lord, Lord, Lord. But anyway, um, again, these are pop art images. Roy Lichtenstein, Wayne Thiebaud, Wayne Thiebaud The Cakes, 1963. Okay. Um, food and consumerist society. So I guess these people are criticizing waste or overconsumption, gluttony. Mm hmm. And this is supposed to be secular, but gluttony is considered wrong. Okay. Um, Edward Hopper, one of my favorites, and depression era issues such as money, hunger, gender, and class. Okay, uh, this is the potato eaters, Vincent van Gogh, and I don't know what is going on in this painting. I've never been able to figure it out. These people look miserable, and I guess that's the point. They're very poor, and all they have to eat is potatoes. All right, um... And then there's this. I, I, did we already see this one? Or we might have seen it, because if you've seen one painting like this, you might as well, might as well have seen them all. Jan David's De Him, Still Life with Ham, Lobster, and Fruit. There's the ham, there's the lobster, fruits all over the place. My stars, my good. And then we have this, I don't know what to call this, like this thing filled with wine over here, and these empty glasses over here. Interesting. And again, like I said, citrus fruits. Citrus fruits always mean it's swank. It's it's plenty of money going on here. Okay. And yes, we have some bread. They they cannot forget the bread. They cannot forget the grapes, the wine. Is there a tablecloth? Of course there is. It's green. Um and a wooden table. They expose the table so the tablecloth isn't covering the whole table like you would normally do in the real world. Because why, why would you do anything other than that? That's the only thing that makes sense. No, they want you to see the wood because the wood is supposed to remind you of the cross. Okay. And then we got fig. Is that a fig? Looks like a fig. Fig, plums. Are these tomatoes down here? I don't know. But, um... And again, this one Sanchez Cotan, his still lifes are just weird. We got this melon, cucumber, cabbage, and either this is an apple or a quince hanging from these strings in what looks like a windowsill. And, and the background is complete, completely black. And I've heard this described as something that's just like an exercise in still life painting. I don't think so. I think there's a lot going on here that we can't really understand. This cabbage looks kind of old. And the the apple or whatever this quince or whatever fruit this is, that looks kind of old too. Is this a memento mori painting? Um, I don't see any flies on the food. So maybe this melon is edible and the cucumber too. But what the hell is going on? Very, very weird. Um... And I analyze these older paintings just the same way that I analyze younger paintings. So that's just my method and that's how I do it. Art Spur Magazine, Food and Art. Um, again, more of the same. These articles start to kind of repeat themselves after a while. You know, Caravaggio, Basket of Fruits, Baroque Artist. And this is supposed to be very reminiscent of Roman era, ancient Rome uh, murals. Okay, and again we have grapes, apples, heloskis. 
Come on now. You know, this is... Hmm. What is Caravaggio trying to say here? He's making it look like it's from ancient Rome, but again, it's fruit that is very obviously symbolic of Christianity or Christ himself. <sighs> and Christ and the biblical story of Adam and Eve and the crucifixion. And here's some figs. Like, what's going on? What is going on, y'all? Mm. And then we have, he even puts a shadow, I think, of these leaves on the wall. What in the world? And then this one. I really, really want to talk about this one, but maybe in another video. This guy, Dwayne Hanson, uh, the lady pushing the shopping cart, crammed full of junk food. This is from 1969. It's called Supermarket Lady. Food and art, as it says here, denouncing overabundance and waste, otherwise known as gluttony. Uh, pop artists, an ode, ode to and critique of industrial food. Well, you know, the, again, this is D Dwayne uh, Hansen with his hype. And this is a sculpture, by the way. You could, this takes up th three dimensional space um, and it's life sized. You know, this is from 1969, late 60s, early 70s. Like, how would they feel about the food today if these artists are still alive? I don't know if they are. I really don't know if they are. But mm, I need to do a whole video on this guy and, like, pop art, um, you know, from the 1960s, especially since we're dealing with lately, you know, I've been talking about Lolita. Um, and, you know, the Humbert Humbert character very, very deeply frowns upon uh, American, you know, slovenly American culture. And I have a feeling Dwayne Hansen is not American either, because look at what he thinks of Americans. Mm. I, 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 I have to think about this for a little while. Um, food, an enhancer of sociocultural issues. Ah. <sighs> Lord, 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 a lot of stuff going on. The culmination of many paradoxes in food. I'll read this little paragraph. If food and art holds this golden place, it is not by chance. It is at the center of many paradoxes, the waste and the necessity, the social and the intimate, the respect of nature amid industrialization, daily life and exceptional moments. It translates as well into a tasty present or a consumed past. Food art is a beautiful way to honor life and conviviality, while also questioning social and cultural determinism. Mm -hmm. I can't say I agree, but that's okay. You know, this, this person seems to have done a good job with this article. Use some good images um, to you know, illustrate something, you know, literally illustrate something with these images. The last article I have, why do great artists paint food? Two critics hash it out. This looks boring as hell to me, but I wanted to provide it for you in case you want some extra reading to do. Um, the Feast of the Gods, Giovanni Bellini and Titian. Okay, so, all right. Uh, it's not it's not turning so it's it's giving me a hard time maybe that's you know the the universe trying to tell me to get on with it what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go take a little break and then we're gonna i'm gonna do what i do best read wikipedia articles so i'll be right back after my own little pumpkin pumpkin spice flavor coffee break i will see you in a minute hold on all right and i'm back with wikipedia so we're talking about food and art today. And of course, Wikipedia has an article about it. Fancy. Anyway, <laughs> food art, as it says here, is a type of art that depicts food, drink, or edible objects as the medium or subject matter of an artistic work to create an attractive visual display or provide social critique. It can be presented in two-dimensional or three-dimensional format, like a painting or sculpture. Food art can also incorporate food as a medium. Contemporary food artists have experimented using different method and techniques, like photography, to change its purpose and use it as a source of storytelling, humor, and highlighting current world issues such as racism and political activism. 
some food art uh, some food artworks use materials like stone to replicate food. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay. Food artworks possess their own characteristics that differentiate them from how food is traditionally perceived to be used. They have their own features in terms of how they appear to the onlooker, the experience they offer to the public, and their meaning. Interesting. Visual performance, viewer participation. I'm not going to get into all of those, but I will leave the um, link for you to look at if you'd like to. The meaning. Huh. Let's talk about the meaning. Let's, let me read this part about the meaning. The meaning of food in the traditional sense is to be used functionally and to provide nourishment by being eaten. Artistic works that use food as a medium can be representational and express emotions metaphorically, as according to the art critic Carolyn Korsmeyer. It can provide a perspective on what it symbolizes. However, it can also be unclear, generally due to its transient form. Their interpretation would be reliant on the timing of which the visitor explores the artwork. Okay. And here are their examples, Wikipedia's examples, of artists who depict or use food. And of course, number one is Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. Okay. And I opened that up over here. Okay, I did a poll video. I will show you. Um, a little while ago, a little while back. Hold on. Oh, where is it? There it is. Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. And I titled it, What's Wrong With This Picture? Now, y'all can go and, and look at that video if you'd like to. It's in my collection, so go ahead and, and take a look at it. Um, in this article, they very quickly summarize it here, and I will read this. The painting represents the scene of the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples from the Gospel of John. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 21 where he announced that one of them would betray him. It is thought to have been painted between 1495 and 1498. Despite the painting focusing on Judas's betrayal, the depictions of the meal features the dense symbolism of the story, with bread and wine incorporated to represent the body and blood of Christ, which he sacrificed on behalf of mankind. Furthermore, plates of fruit and fish, likely eels or herring, are displayed upon the tablecloth. They're not easy to see, especially since this thing is, has been through a lot. Um, researchers have suggested that although eels would not have been served at the original meal, it is symbolic and popular during the Renaissance period when Leonardo da Vinci produced it. Interesting. And again, they have these other examples, uh, Giuseppe Archimboldo, The Four Seasons, again, a human made out of food, um, P Pieter Ertsen Market Scenes, okay, uh, Anne Valier Coster, Still Life with the Lobster, I think we saw that, or something similar to it in, in the articles that I already went through, and Dieter Roth, who just uses food as a medium, apparently, uh, especially chocolate, interesting, and they have see alsos, they have butter sculptures, <laughs> okay, um, butter sculpture, contemporary art, culinary arts, edible art, food photography, food porn, food presentation, gastronomy, modern art, and sugar sculptures. Interesting. Interesting. I'm not here to talk about sugar sculptures, but I wanted to, you know, uh, remind you about The Last Supper, okay? It's probably the ultimate. It's called La Ultima Cena, but it's, it's probably the ultimate, like, work of art that features food. Everybody knows this painting, or mural, rather. Then there's also another one. I've also talked about this artist and this painting in one of my videos. Can I find it? There it is. Edward Hopper, Realism, Loneliness, Alienation, and a Splash of Red. That's the eight months ago. Okay, so check that out if you're interested in Hopper. Um, the Nighthawks is the one they talk about as a painting that features food. Does it really, though? 
I don't know. And they talk about how many times it's been parodied. Okay, check it out. Where is the food? Hello again. I don't know what the hell happened, but my recorder was acting crazy. So here I am again and picking up where I left off. Um, anyway, so a diner is where food is served. So it means something, especially in American culture, especially with regard to some of the stuff that we've been looking at. Um, with pop art, oh God, now everything's going to take forever to load again. But now, my computer just completely stopped dead in its tracks. And thank goodness it saved the video that I already did. Um, but whatever. So I need to get a little bit better at doing this. But anyway, so the, the Nighthawks painting, a diner where there's no food, these people look like they're there just to get a cup of coffee very, very late at night. So this is, again, they talk about this in the context of a food painting. Um, where is it? I know that this is why I opened up the, the, um, the file. Ugh. For, for Nighthawks. I think I did anyway, if I'm not mistaken. But it's, it's talked about as a food painting or a pe painting featuring food, but it doesn't feature food. There's like a serious absence of food here other than the coffee and the salt and pepper shakers. So I don't know what's going on. Um, there's a couple more that I wanted to show you. There's food art favorites at the National Gallery. Okay. And here they are. Uh, more shellfish. More oysters, more nuts, more wine. These look like little candies in the center. Shells, um, these little dumplings or cookie-looking things. I don't know what this back here is, but whatever. It's called Dishes with Oysters, Fruit, and Wine. Okay. Uh, from, does it say from when? Yeah, it does. 1620, 1625. By Osias Birt, the Elder. Uh, then there's a basket of fruits. Look at it. Look at it. And I'm telling you, each and every one of these has a religious significance. And these plates positioned on either side of the fruit inside of the basket. Very weird. Very, very, very weird. Um, still life with peacock pie. I've never heard of peacock pie, but okay more citrus. Like I said, whenever you see citrus, this is luxurious food. They got a roast chicken or duck in the center. Bread. More bread. But I assume are apples. And then there's this pie in the background. I don't know what's going on. Um, more bread and figs and wine and whatever is, I guess the barrel is the wine. This is by Luis Melendez from 1770. Still life with figs and bread. Okay. There's this one that features, again, butcher shop products. Uh, still life with dressed game meat and fruit. Okay. Um, Raphael Peel, a, des uh, a dessert. Lemons, oranges, nuts, raisins. Instead of fresh grapes, raisins. Very significant. And wine. Um... Paul Cezanne, another still life of his. He does a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Still life with apples and peaches. Going to have to take a better look at his stuff one day. Uh, Robert Selden Duncanson, still life with fruits and nuts. 1848, oil on board. Okay. Uh, Walt Kuhn, green apples and scoop. Okie dokie. And then this one. James Rosenquist, White Bread, 1964. Again, is this a criticism of American culture? I don't know, but there's that. Um, there's this. Uh, maybe I should pick up with these in another. I want to do these articles in a, and do like my own separate video reaction to these articles in another another video and maybe talk about Dwayne Hansen a little bit and some more pop art um, featuring food or just maybe 
rendering some kind of commentary on food or consumerist culture. Again, my machine just crapped out on me like you wouldn't believe. So I think I've said what I wanted to say in this video. I won't take up very much more of your time. I'll be back. And I think I might just do, again, Dwayne Hansen and another artist that, again, they deal they deal in absurdity. And it does have to do with food and American culture, pop culture, whatever. So I'll come back with that one maybe in a day or so. Um, again, I'll reiterate my church announcements. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. Uh, new viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you enjoy it. And I will be back with more. I will be analyzing more uh, with regard to Lolita, with regard to uh, The Shining, and etc., etc. And I'm going to try and, and watch some more. Uh, movies like Eyes Wide Shut, like Spartacus, whatever. And I'm going to come back with more art history videos or just videos talking about art historical concepts like this food and art thing that I tried to do here. So stay tuned for that. Um, and that's all for now. I'm, I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm warm. I'm dry. Wasn't really much rain where I'm at um, in LA. So we're okay. That's why I'm making this video tonight, because I'm happy to be alive. So until next time, until I find yet another reason to talk at you in one of these videos, I will go ahead and bid you bye-bye. Wait a minute. Hold on. Please don't forget to comment. I say don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. I especially, I especially enjoy reading your comments, so I can't wait to hear your ideas. Or if you want me to talk about an artist or an art movement or whatever, let me know in the comments. Um, so I can do that for my next video. I'm a little bit flustered right now because my equipment is being funky. So, uh, there now until next time, I'll go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So bye-bye everybody.